After Jesus had ascended into heaven, two angels appeared to his disciples and said, This Jesus who has been taken from you will return, just as you saw him go up into the heavens. The early Christians believed that Jesus would return soon to establish his kingdom and to restore the rule to Israel. Thus, at the very end of the book of Revelation, we read, Come, Lord Jesus. And Jesus answers, Yes, I am coming soon. Even today we say in the Mass, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. The mother of Jesus is alleged to have said at one of her recent apparitions, the coming of Jesus is imminent. First, however, as St. Paul wrote, the mass apostasy or great revolt against God and his church has to take place. The man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, or antichrist, has to be revealed, and then Jesus will come and destroy him with the breath of his mouth and establish his reign of love and peace. When we look at today's society with its loss of faith and even hatred of God and his church, we have to ask, could this be the beginning of that great apostasy or revolt foretold in the Bible? If so, then we must also look for the sign of victory promised in the Bible. This sign of victory is the mysterious woman the Bible speaks of in Genesis 3.15 and Revelation 12, the first and last books of the Bible. In Genesis 3.15, we read that after the serpent that is the devil, had led Eve into sin, God said to him, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. She shall crush your head and you shall lie in wait for her heel. That's the duet version. Some modern translators substitute he for she because our victory over Satan comes through Jesus. However, a masculine pronoun does not belong in that sentence. Throughout the centuries, the Catholic Church has taught that the woman of Genesis 3.15 was Mary, the mother of Jesus, who would be the new Eve given us by God to undo the harm done by the old Eve through sin. That is why statues of the Immaculate Conception present her crushing the head of the serpent, that is, Satan. This mysterious and powerful woman appears again in Revelation 12 to fulfill the promise of Genesis 3.15. A great sign appeared in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. You may find a footnote in your modern Bible which says that scholars believe that this woman is a church in symbol because all the details did not fit Mary. This may be the opinion of some scholars, but those who are in tune with the official magisterium of the church know that this woman is Mary. Four popes in this century have very clearly stated this. Pope St. Pius X on February 2nd, 1904, Pope Pius XII, Pope Paul VI on May 13th, 1967, and finally, Pope John Paul II on March 25, 1987. 
If we read Revelation 12 carefully, we see that the details fit Mary much better than the church because it was Mary and not the church who gave birth to the Savior. Our Lady herself, appearing in Guadalupe in 1531, left an image of herself on the tilma of Juan Diego, presenting herself as a young woman standing on a dark crescent of the moon, which, like the serpent, is a symbol of Satan. That is why there was an uproar recently against Proctor and Gamble, whose symbol was a crescent of the moon. Mary presents herself tramping the crescent under her feet. She is clothed with the sun. The rays of the sun emanate from her whole person, and stars cover her mantle. So already over 460 years ago, Mary herself left us clear proof in Mexico that she is the woman clothed with the sun of Revelation 12. This sign brought about the greatest miracle of conversion to the faith of native Mexicans. Until then, they had been offering thousands of human beings in sacrifice to demons each year. Now millions abandoned this practice and entered the church. Have you wondered why Jesus called his mother woman when he addressed her directly at Cana and on Calvary? I believe it was because she is that woman of mystery of Genesis 3 and Revelation 12. Revelation 12 also speaks of the other sign of our times, the huge dragon, flaming red, Satan, who fights against this woman and her offspring, Jesus, and not being able to prevail, goes and makes war on those who keep God's commandments and bear witness to Jesus. We're living today in the days foretold in Genesis 3 and Revelation 12, days of a great battle between good and evil, days of great confusion in society and the church. And this confusion is the work of Satan, the dragon of Revelation. He has infiltrated many false prophets into the church who are trying to subvert the age-old teachings of the church and teach us a new gospel, which is not of God, but of Satan. These false prophets are especially the neo-modernists, the New Agers, the rationalists, the humanists, and others of whom Pope Paul VI said sadly on June 20th, 1972, we believed that after the council would come a day of sunshine in the history of the church, but instead there has come a day of clouds and storms and of darkness there has been a power, an adversary power. Let us call him by his name, the devil. It is as if from some crack the smoke of Satan has entered the temple of God. The evil which exists in the world is the result and effect of an attack upon us and our society by a dark and hostile agent, the devil. Yet this turmoil did not come unforeseen. It was foretold by Pope Leo XIII in 1884. In October of that year, he had a vision one day after Mass. He heard Satan say, give me 100 years and I'll destroy your church. He then heard God respond, you have the 100 years, but you will not destroy her. The Pope was visibly shaken. People rushed to him saying, Holy Father, are you sick? He answered, No, but I saw what would happen to the church in the next century. To prepare the church for the coming battle with the powers of darkness, the Pope composed a prayer to St. Michael. We used to recite after every low mass before Vatican II. Pope Leo also wrote an encyclical letter on the Holy Spirit and ordered a novena 
to the Holy Spirit to be celebrated each year before Pentecost in every Catholic Church. He hoped that people would open their hearts to the Holy Spirit and he would prepare them for the coming battle with Satan. Unfortunately, the directive of the Pope was not received with enthusiasm. The Holy Spirit was not understood or considered important, as he is still not understood or considered important by many. We are reaping the fruit of this negligence today because without the Holy Spirit we cannot come to a living faith and to the truth and can easily be led astray by the false prophets of today. When Mary appeared at Fatima, Portugal in 1917, she promised mankind a sign that her message was from God. And this sign was an amazing spectacle of the sun witnessed by perhaps 100,000 people. It had been raining hard. Suddenly the clouds parted and the sun seemed to be gyrating and coming downwards towards the earth. The people fell on their knees in the mud, thinking it was the end of the world. Then the sun returned to its place and the people found themselves clean and dry. Another sign that Mary is the woman clothed with the sun of Revelation 12. Today, Rome is swamped with reports of Mary's apparitions in many places in the world. Though we are not obliged to believe in private apparitions and revelations, is it wise to close our ears when God may be speaking to us? Jesus wept over Jerusalem because it did not know the time of its visitation. Mary is alleged to have been appearing in Medjugorje, Yugoslavia almost daily since June 24, 1981. One of the signs of her presence there are signs in the sun, which many people have seen and continue to see. Surely the woman clothed with the sun of Revelation 12. When I was in Medjugorje in mid-August 1988, I was hearing confessions on the lawn outside of the church. It was around 6 p.m. when the rosary was being said in the church before Mass. The sun was still quite high and hot. I looked towards the sun and noticed it didn't hurt my eyes. So I removed my sunglasses and looked again. Sure enough, I was able to look right at the sun with a naked eye. It was like a full moon, only much brighter and larger. Around the sun were areas of color, mostly gold, red, blue, and gray. Then something beautiful happened. Directly below the sun, perfect valentines of light began to form in gold, red, blue, and gray, and they traveled slowly in a semicircle on the right side of the sun and went upwards into the sky, one after the other, nonstop. I then turned to my left and looked at the concrete cross on the distant mountain. The same thing happened all over again. The colored valentines of light rising from the base of the cross and traveling in a semicircle around the cross and upwards into the sky. In fact, the signs of Medjugorje are the woman, the cross, the heart, the sun, and she is said by the seers to wear a crown of stars. I've seen any number of rosaries the chains of which have turned from silver color to gold color, not only of people who have been there, but of people who pray anywhere for the conversion of the world as requested by Our Lady. The meaning is supposed to be that she has bound us to herself with chains of gold and will protect us in the coming days of trial. This even happens at some of these services when I speak of the Blessed Virgin. 
One thing about Medjugorje is that Mary has put herself out on a limb, so to speak. She has promised signs to be announced in advance, so the whole world will know beyond any doubt that her visits are authentic. These signs are to be several warnings and then a complete purification of the world from atheism, unbelief, and immorality. One would have to be blind to deny the miracles of conversion happening there, which are positive proof of the strong presence of the Holy Spirit. Millions of people from all over the world have returned to faith. In Yugoslavia itself, a million and a half have left communism and returned to the church. Mary is also appearing in other places in the world, some officially approved. The message is always the same, return to living the gospel through conversion, fasting, prayer, especially prayer from the heart and the rosary. When Mary appeared at Fatima in 1917, she said that World War I would soon end, but if people did not repent, a worse war would begin in the reign of the next pope, and Russia would spread her errors around the world, inciting wars. But if people repented and prayed, especially the rosary, Russia would be converted and a period of peace would follow. People paid little attention to this message, and in the reign of the next pope, Hitler moved into Austria and other areas, the beginning of the war, though no shots were fired yet. And Russia has been spreading atheistic communism all over the world. We could have changed the course of history if we had listened to the message from heaven in 1917. We can change the course of history today if we listen to her current messages. In fact, because enough people have been praying and fasting, we've seen the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. When the president of the Bishops' Conference of Korea in November 1990 tried to give the Pope credit for the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, the Pope replied, no, that is the work of Our Lady. She said it at Fatima and Medjugorje. I wasn't surprised that communism collapsed because Mary had promised that Russia would glorify God the most. We were all surprised that it happened so quickly and so smoothly. Only God could have done it. In 1955, the Russians suddenly pulled out of Austria, which they were occupying, and we couldn't understand why. They were out to conquer the world. I learned recently during a trip through Austria that it was because between 500,000 and 700,000 rosaries were being offered by the Austrians each day for the deliverance of their country. It got too hot for Satan and he walked out. This is a confirmation of the message of Fatima that the rosary can bring about the conversion of Russia and even the world. The events in Russia today are bearing witness to the truth of Mary's words. Last year, in 1991 that is, both the Life and Time magazines had serious articles about Medjugorje, stating that the collapse of communism was the work of Mary. One of the messages given by Mary at Medjugorje is a confirmation that this century is, in fact, under the power of Satan, as foretold by Pope Leo XIII. However, his power is waning and will soon come to an end with the victory of Jesus and Mary. The collapse of communism is the first sign of Satan's loss of power. In Revelation 12, verse 12, we read, Woe to you, earth and sea, for the devil has come down upon you. His fury knows no limits, for he knows his time is short. We need only to look 
at the world in this century to see that a powerful force of evil is at work everywhere. In this century, we've seen two terrible world wars and many lesser ones. Besides the millions killed in Europe, some 60 million were killed in the USSR and perhaps 100 million in China. In no other century has so much human blood been shed. In our own country, we've seen some terrible decisions of our Supreme Court. They legalized pornography under the pretext of freedom of speech and press. Our founding fathers never dreamed of such a thing. They legalized abortion under the excuse of privacy. What does privacy have to do with killing babies? They outlawed God and prayer from our schools under the excuse of separation of church and state. So why do they have chaplains in the Congress, armed forces and so forth? I went to public schools. We had prayer, Bible reading, and religious classes until the court decided that God should be thrown out to make room for humanistic programs. We've seen great confusion in the church caused chiefly by the heresy of modernism, which wants to reinterpret our faith and the Bible in a new rationalistic, humanistic way. In a short period after Vatican II, we've seen over 7,000 brothers and 10,000 priests abandon their vocations. Over 30,000 sisters left their convents, 50,000 according to Donna Steichen in ungodly rage, and many others have been corrupted by unchristian feminist theology and are working to destroy our faith in Jesus and God by false teachings. Certainly this is not the work of the Holy Spirit. If a religious vocation is from God, the loss of it is not, whatever the reasons. In our society we see much crime, drug abuse, murders, immorality, breakup of marriages and family life, a collapse of Christian living in Western Europe, the United States and Canada. The West, in fact, has lost God and has become godless to a great extent, and this is the work of Satan. I personally believe that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Revelation. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison. He will go out and seduce the nations in all four corners of the earth. In view of the vision of Pope Leo XIII and Medjugorje, I believe this passage is speaking of our times. In the end, however, Jesus will destroy Satan's power, and the words he spoke before his passion will finally be fulfilled. Now will the prince of this world be cast out. I believe further that the signs of God's intervention in history promise us that Mary's apparitions may be those Jesus spoke of when he said, there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish, distraught at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Men will die of fright in anticipation of what is coming upon the world. However, only unrepentant sinners need to fear because Jesus added, when these things begin to happen, stand erect and hold your heads high, for your deliverance is near at hand. Why was Satan given such power? People give him power by siding with him against God, by living in sin. Many people enjoy being deceived by Satan, thinking they are being liberated They are rejecting Jesus and his teachings, which could set them free. Jesus said, my yoke is sweet and my burden is light. But people are saying, in effect, Satan's yoke is more fun. St. John wrote about Jesus, to his own he came, yet his own did not accept him. I believe further that we may be living in the beginning of the days of the mass apostasy, of which St. Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians. According to a German publication, we've been losing to the faith over 7,000 persons each day in the West. The faith is almost dead in Northern Europe. 
In France, only 6% go to church, mostly elderly. In other countries, less than 10%. In the Scandinavian countries, between 1% and 2%. In England, few people outside of Irish Catholics attend church. In the United States, only 43% of Catholics go to church. St. Paul wrote to St. Timothy that in the last days, people following their own desires will surround themselves with teachers who tickle their ears with false teachings. For many people today, the teacher is not Jesus, nor the Bible, nor the church, nor the Pope, but the spirit of the world, humanism, and its powerful tool, television. In fact, many people sit glued to the TV set by the hour, soaking in the poison of corruption, perversion, violence, and worldliness, which are getting worse with almost every passing day. Yet Satan can do only what God permits him. If we had been a spirit-filled people, Satan would not be able to sow confusion in our midst. He has not deceived people of prayer who were close to God and led by the Holy Spirit. What St. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in the first century is especially true today. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, human forces that is, but against the principalities and powers, the rulers of this world of darkness and evil spirits in regions above, that is, fallen angels. Against such powers, our human strength is no match. We desperately need the Holy Spirit to survive. And God wants to pour out his spirit on all mankind. But mankind must reject Satan and not side with him through enslavement to sin. With or without us, the reign of Jesus and the Holy Spirit will come, for God has promised it. But woe to those who are not on God's side.